a bit embarrassing to come up here after all these amazing people, Jim, Frady, I, you know, I'm just this guy, you know? Um, what am I doing up here? But I do want to thank uh, American Atheists for, um, for the kind invitation. There we go. Just leave it like that. Uh, this is my first American Atheist convention. It's not my first time in Cincinnati, as, as Kelly had mentioned. Um, really quickly, uh, it's kind of interesting here to be here on Good Friday. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a weird little holiday for me. I love watching Last Temptation of Christ every year on Good Friday. It's my own personal thing. My son, this is my son Patrick, he's seven. He was telling me that he was excited about it too, uh, except he said, well, you know, it's, it's, it's Good Luck Friday this Friday. I'm out of school. And I said, wait a minute, Good Luck Friday? He says, yeah, it's Good Luck Friday. I said, no, no, it's Good Friday. Do you understand what the reason for that is? And he said, no, not really. And I, like, explained it to him. And he knows a little bit. I'm sort of, like, slowly familiarizing him with, with theological concepts. Anyway, I get to the point where Jesus is crucified. And he says, Dad, what? They killed Jesus? I said, yeah. And, and it was this day. And, and they call it Good Friday. And he says, Dad, I thought they liked him. <laughs> I don't quite get it either. But... but I'd like to start off by telling a little bit about who I am and, and what brought me here. So, um, again, my story starts here in Cincinnati. I live in Dallas-Fort Worth right now, uh, but Cincinnati is my hometown, and it, it really always will be. Uh, one of my earliest memories, in fact, is walking uh, past Fountain Square, um, just where we were a little bit earlier. Um, I grew up playing on the playgrounds at Sawyer Point down by the river. Uh, I went to school and over the Rhine, a little bit up the ways, and I was actually, believe it or not, I was right here in this very hotel for my junior high school prom. In this, in this built, this picture was taken in the lobby right outside there 22 years ago. Isn't that crazy? Anyway, good looking guy. Uh, now, uh, by the time I had grown up and I, I was in high school, we actually had moved out to a town called Mason, which at the time nobody had ever heard of Mason. Now, probably everybody in, in town does know it. Um, and I was obviously one of the coolest guys in school, as you can see. Yeah, I stayed in town for college. I went to UC, go Bearcats, and I graduated eventually with a doctorate in molecular biology, and that's the doctor part of the Dr. Zachary Moore. Um, that degree led me to Texas, where I took a, a fellowship at the uh, UT Southwestern Medical Center, and that's what, that's what brought me to Texas. Now, so that's sort of my life's path. Um, I, like many of you, was raised religious. Um, I was raised, my family was Christian. I actually, it sounds maybe crazy to say, I kind of loved it. I really enjoyed it. I took it very seriously, and, and everything about it was, was very interesting to me. Now, we were, as a family, a bit on the theological margins. Uh, my first church was a Reformed Baptist church, which I'm sure nobody's ever heard of that, right? Uh, so really quick, if you want to know what Reformed Baptists are, think of Southern Baptists with all the flavors sucked right out of them. That's, that's pretty much what they are. But, but by and large, even though we were on the margins, we did fit in pretty well with the broader evangelical culture that was in existence and very, very uh, influential at the time. Um, so I did all sorts of standard evangelical things. I went to vacation Bible school. Um, I was enrolled in the Focus on the Family fan club or kids club or whatever. McGee and me. Anybody remember that? No? Yeah, McGee and me. Um, you know, I, when I was in high school, I prayed at the flagpole. They might do that, yeah. I organized Bible studies at, uh, after school. I did all those sorts of things. When I went to college, I, I joined the Campus Crusade for Christ. Now it's just called Crew. And uh, I did the really important thing of asking Jesus into my heart, accepting him as my Lord and Savior. And I became a Christian. And for a while, it was really simple until it really wasn't that simple anymore. And I'll just cut to the chase. So I decided I'd had enough. I, um, I, I, really wanted to, um, I, I really wanted to understand what it was that I believed and why I believed it, and I, it led me to the inevitable, irrevocable conclusion that I could not anymore accept the Bible as the Word of God. It just it could not cut the mustard. 
Now, that's a bit of a problem for somebody like me who came from a, an evangelical sort of fundamentalist background where you had that, that was the central part of what we believed in. The, the Bible is the word of God. But I loved being a Christian. I didn't really want to give that up, and I needed some way to stay a Christian without having the Bible be, be central to that. And this is going to sound like the butt of a joke. At the time, I was quite serious. I decided the way to do that was to become a Catholic. And so that's what I did. I was baptized here and confirmed in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, in northern Kentucky. And uh, for a time, it worked. You know, for a time, I was happy. Um, but I discovered that the very same criticisms about the scriptures that I had also applied equally to the magisterium itself. And I, I thought maybe they would cancel each other out or make it easier. And it didn't really. It just made it worse. And for a little while, I was content to be discontent. But then the American dioceses began to sue the federal government over the Affordable Care Act when it was passed, and I decided I'd had enough. So I wrote a letter to the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, and I said, I want to be formally uh, taken off the rolls. Uh, there's a procedure to go through, and I wrote a letter explaining what I want to do and, and, and how to do it, and they wrote me this really great letter back that says, well, tough shit basically, you, you can't leave. And the reason is because the Pope at the time had just by himself, he'd said, you know what, we're gonna take that law and just get rid of it. Nobody's allowed to take themselves off the rolls anymore. So then I'm kind of stuck. I'm Catholic, and I, whether I like it or not. Well, it just so happens that there is one other way of, of losing your Catholicism is to be excommunicated, right? And there's a really easy way to be excommunicated. If, you wanted, if you're interested, there's a canon law. It's Canon Law 1367 says that if you take a consecrated host for sacrilegious purposes, then you're automatically kicked out of the church. As it happens. <laughs> this is a consecrated host. I swiped it from mass. And I've brought it here to the American Atheist Convention. So, I think I'm done. I think we're done. All right. Now that a little bit of blasphemy is over, um, I'm going to spend the rest of my talk focusing on evangelical Christians. Evangelicals are not all Christians. They are the, the problematic ones, let's say. They are a subgroup that think that they speak for all other Christians. And, and that's sort of where I came out of, and that's who I've been spending my time with, and that's what I, I want to talk about with. Now, when I, um, when I left the church... I wasn't really looking to antagonize Christians. I, I thought I was kind of done with it. And in fact, I even kind of had a soft spot in my heart for other Christians, especially evangelical Christians. This is J.I. Packer, for any of you who are theology nerds. He's very, very popular in uh, evangelical communities. His book, Knowing God, is one of the most influential evangelical books of the 20th century. And I totally fanboyed out and spent about an hour talking with him. That was great. Um, at the same event, I spent some time talking with this guy, not Hitchens, no, 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 the guy in black. You probably don't know him. His name's Kevin Harris. But if you've ever listened to any of William Lane Craig's radio shows or podcasts, you've heard Kevin's voice because Kevin is his radio producer. And I got to know Kevin when I first came to Texas. And Kevin had invited a group of atheists to come to his church, and he was going to interview them and, and find out like what they care about and, and who they are and, and, and what sort of makes them tick. And I heard about this. I wasn't one of the ones invited. I heard about this, and I thought, this is amazing. I've never seen anything like this in Cincinnati. I never dreamed I would see anything like this in Texas, and yet here it is. And I went, and I saw it, and it was unbelievable. I was totally blown away. I thought, I need to spend as much time as I can talking with evangelical Christians like Kevin and getting to know him and, and starting up these conversations and dialogues and talking publicly with them and, and doing all these great things and being respectful and asking questions and learning. I wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to be part of meaningful conversations with evangelicals. And I it did as best I could to encourage other atheists to join me. Uh, I spent about the next decade and a half doing just that. I met with uh, evangelical after evangelical in venue after venue after venue, and I brought atheists along with me and promoted it to them. I created loads and loads of opportunities for dialogue, and it wasn't easy, right? 
I had to go looking for these opportunities. I had to knock on the doors of churches. I had to find where the evangelicals were gathering. I had to sort of ingratiate myself into their presence. And I uh, you know, got to know all these different apologetics organizations. I went into universities, I went to university groups, and I had some really great conversations at the end of it all. I did, I did, and I, I did make some good friends, but I'm here to tell you now that I think I wasted that time. I think I wasted that time. I wasted that time because the valuable conversations that I had, the rewarding relationships that I found, were the exception and not the rule. The more time I spent traveling in and out of churches, it became obvious that the vast majority of evangelicals have no interest in these types of conversations or dialogue or even understanding my point of view. All they really want to do the vast majority of evangelicals, is just maintain the borders of their own personal theological bubbles. They don't want to hear what I have to say anymore. Okay, fine. I'm done. I'm officially now retired from reaching out and trying to dialogue with evangelicals. What I have to say, instead, I'm going to say to you. All right? First, some bad news, and then we'll get to the good news. <laughs> I'll try to go through the bad stuff quickly, though. <laughs> so the bad news is that evangelicals have more power now than they've ever had before, and they're doing everything they can to abuse it. Evangelical leaders in this country like Jerry Falwell Jr., James Dobson, and Dallas's own Robert Effing Jeffress are seeking to consolidate power in such a way that sets them apart from really every other kind of religious group in America. They are now linked with the political leadership of this presidential administration in, in a way that really is unprecedented. Now, the significance of this cannot be understated. This is not run-of-the-mill religious power grubbing or an hypocrisy that you see sort of, you know, day in, day out. What we see now is a phenomenon that's going to be analyzed and dissected by historians and social scientists for generations to come. Because it's one thing it kind of makes sense for Catholics to support a Catholic like John Kennedy for president, right? It makes sense for Methodists to support, you know, somebody like George W. Bush when he runs for president. It makes no sense at all for evangelicals to support a person whose life, whose values, and whose behavior are completely inconsistent with anything about that evangelicals actually believe or claim to believe. There is nothing in the president that is consistent with orthodox Christianity in any form. And yet, just this past week, Michelle Bachman, a leading evangelical, called the president the most biblical and godly president in history. Okay? This, what we're seeing now, this is a distinctly evangelical phenomenon. Again, not all Christians, hashtag not all Christians. This is distinctly evangelical. When you look at social surveys, and I've got some of this data here. When you look at the social surveys, whoops. Uh, so the red line at the top, that's the evangelical. And that's support of the president. The evangelicals stand by themselves supporting this president. No other religious group supports this president like evangelicals do. The Catholics don't support him. The non-religious, I'm happy to say, don't support him. Although, I'll tell you, the group that has the least amount of support is black Christians. It's way down at the bottom. Way down at the bottom. Right? So, <clears throat> what we see here is the, the, the followers are, are definitely following along with their leaders. And it, this, is, you know, this is not something that you see in just the people who are sort of casually identifying as evangelicals. When you find out which evangelicals attend church more frequently, their level of support actually increases by about 10%. Evangelicals who attend church more often are more likely to support someone who is totally inconsistent with evangelical quote-unquote values. Now, in North Texas, we have two of these evangelical leaders. They're actually on the evangelical advisory board for the president. Uh, Jack Graham and Robert Morris. They're both pastors of mega churches, 50,000 people between them, uh, between their churches. Their churches are enormous. They, they're the size of community colleges. They're about the size of University of Cincinnati, just up the street. One of them, uh, Prestonwood, that's passed by Jack Graham, has not one but two Starbucks inside in case you, you know, you have to walk too far to get to the other one. They have pool tables, air hockey tables, video games for the kids. 
They've got all that sort of fun stuff. They've got uh, smoke machines, laser shows. It's more AV than you might find at Coachella, honestly. And it's precisely these types of megachurches that have grown over the past several decades. And they've been filled with primarily evangelicals. Evangelical Christians make up the vast majority of these megachurches. And they're found, with some exception, right? The, you find the most of them actually in California, believe it or not. But the, the vast majority of the rest of them are found in the South, in Texas, Florida, Georgia, Tennessee. We have them here all over. Of course, there's, there's, there's megachurches here in Cincinnati as well. Now, when I visit these churches, I like to meet the people and, and, and just sort of find out what they're thinking and uh, just ask them basic questions like, well, what sort of theology is taught here? Just, I just ask random people. I usually get one of three answers. Number one, well, I don't know, but uh, you could probably ask one of the pastors and he would know. Uh, two, well, I don't know, but you could probably look it up on the website. Or number three, uh, I, I actually, what is theology? What is that? I don't, I don't really know. Okay, so let's sum all this up. The current state of affairs. This is the bad news. American evangelicals have more power now than any other religious group. They've used that power to elect a president that all other religious groups reject. They build enormous gilded shrines to a theology they don't actually understand, let alone believe in, and they've outnumbered us all. Okay, the good news is, the good news is that last part isn't really true anymore. <laughs> So this has been the religious trend, and you've probably seen this. It's probably come across your Facebook feed. This is the trend over the past 30 years or so of religious self-identity. And the no-religion group has grown like crazy. And guess what? They just looked at the new, new data, and American evangelicalism is no longer at the top. No religion is now at the top. Just, just by a hair, but we're at the top. We, we're, there's now more non-religious people than there are Catholics or evangelicals or any other religious group. That is good news. Uh, and when you look at this, this, this trend, right, we, you wonder, well, how is this going to happen in the future? What is, how, how are you going to project this out? And it's almost always a bad idea to project, extrapolate from data, especially social trends. But what the hell, I'm going to do it. And... This is what you see when you draw a best fit line among these trends. You see the no, no religion rising like a, uh, like a bowl of warm dough, and Catholics and evangelicals are shrinking like weak old balloons. Slowly but surely, they will be shrinking, right? This is not something that is isolated to America, and if we want to look at some, some data that shows what that looks like in long term, we, all we have to do is look at, look at England. Close your eyes and think of England, right? So, they're, they're about two generations ahead of us. So they started crossing over way back in the early 90s, and it just kept going up. And the mainstream uh, Christian faiths started, kept on going down, and now they're, they're all sort of at the bottom in this sort of sad little minority mix, right? That's the situation that it is right now. Now, if anybody has been paying attention on social media recently, uh, you may have noticed something interesting kind of happening within the evangelical community itself. So, again, not, only, uh, not all Christians are evangelicals. Not all evangelicals go along with this stuff, right? It's not 100%. And there's loads and loads of evangelicals for whom that they do not consider themselves lockstep with the president. And for many of them, the 2016 election was a worldview-shattering event, somewhat analogous to the role that 9-11 played in galvanizing the new atheists. So remember, 9-11 challenged the idea that merely having faith in something was necessarily a good thing, right? Well, the 2016 election challenged the idea that, that being a Christian was necessarily a good thing. And this is going on in the minds of evangelical Christians. So many of these evangelicals looked around and they were just as disgusted as we were. They looked at their churches and they saw the hypocrisy. They saw the hatefulness, the willful ignorance. They saw power-hungry leadership. Now, we've been seeing it for years, but they, they, they see it now too. And they've decided that they want nothing to do with it. Now, again, these are not necessarily atheists. 
Some of them are leaving the, the evangelical church and they're becoming atheists, yes. But a lot of them are leaving evangelicalism and joining some other Christian denomination, some more progressive Christian denomination. They are starting to call themselves ex-evangelicals. That will be a term that you need to know. It is somewhat analogous to the new atheists. The ex-evangelicals is a phenomenon happening right now in the evangelical movement. They also tend to be quite a bit younger than sort of the old school evangelicals. And if you look at, this is, this is actually data from an evangelical from the, from the Barna Research Group. If you look at the cohorts, so elders are my grandparents' generation, Generation Z are kids just graduating high school now, right? Atheists, the, the self-identification of atheism has doubled over this time, and nearly uh, 40%, that's two out of every five in Generation Z identifies as non-religious. Okay, what, is, what will this look like in the future? Well, again, look at England. They're two generations ahead of us. Their Generation Z is nearly 75% non-religious. This will be us in two generations. That is the good news. You can clap now. That's the good news. So what does this mean for us? right here and right now. So I think, number one, we can pat ourselves on the backs a little bit and, and try to work at, norm, at you know, for all the work that we've done to normalize atheism over the years. But this also means that we have to start planning right now for a very different kind of future. The society that we're entering into is gonna look very different from the one that we've been used to. Right here and right now, yes, it's true, evangelicals are still acting terribly. And yes, they still have power. And yes, there are still many, many fights worth fighting and we should fight them. But, but when I look at how evangelicalism has diminished theologically and subsumed itself for political power, I really don't see anything left worth engaging. That is why I say that I wasted my time. With very few exceptions, there's nothing left that's positive, nothing worth building bridges into, no conversations worth having, no relationships worth salvaging. Evangelicals have only themselves to blame for this. They focused on the negative for so long, on discrimination for so long, that there's no fruit left on that tree. I should know. I've spent the past decade attempting to find another piece of fruit, and I haven't found it. So I'm not going to shed a tear when the tree withers of its own sickness and is cut down. The reason we need to be aware of this right now is because I predict that the evangelicals will soon, will soon start coming to us we will still be very useful enemies to them. Just like Ken Ham across the river begging us to come over, right? They need somebody to antagonize. They need scary stories to tell their kids at night. They need someone to help them get the attention of the media. And we cannot give it to them, all right? There's no reason for any of us to give our time, our effort, or our energy to any of them. Why do you think Ray Comfort is over there at the Ark Park begging for us to come over and meet him? You know, a Subway gift card isn't going to do it, Ray. I'm sorry. You come here. You come here. Get your ass over here. We don't need evangelicals to be our enemies anymore. They need us. All we need from them is to either reform or be forgotten. That'll be it. Okay. Now, in the meantime, in the meantime, there will still be loads of opportunities to confront people, right? You've got Atheist Experience that's doing it really well. You've got Anthony Magnabosco in San Antonio, and you've also got these guys over here. This is Rex Owen, or uh, Rex Burks and, and Owen Younger, uh, and they do something called Skeptical Texans in North Texas, where they actually go into churches, and they kind of try to deconvert them directly. It's kind of an interesting thing. Um, it's not really my thing anymore, but there is still room for this, and if this is your thing, then, then go for it, and I think they have a good, uh, good model for that. My thing was really more about building bridges, having conversations, and just because the evangelicals are off the table doesn't mean I'm going to stop doing that. I'm just going to find somebody better to have those conversations with, and it's not too hard. All you have to do is look at interfaith activities. So there's a really great group called Peace Together now in North Texas, and they specifically invite atheists to be a part of their table, to be a part of their process, because they know that in the past, evangelicals have tried to exclude us or convert us. 
and they don't want to have any part of that. So there's Muslims there, there's Christians, good, you know, the good progressive Christians, Presbyterians, Methodists, etc. cetera. Uh, it's led by a Reformed Jewish rabbi. There's loads of Reformed Jews here in Cincinnati. You guys need to start making some friends and start doing these sorts of activities, right? And we also need to redouble our efforts at building bridges within our own communities, right? So we've got this fantastic event, the Women of Color Beyond Belief coming up. That is a huge milestone, right? We need to be doing everything that we can to support all these fantastic atheists of color, right? Not just atheists of color, Hispanics, uh, Asian atheists, any sort of ethnic background that's had a kind of a rough shake of it. The LGBTQ community, we need to be doing as much as we can with, with this group. Sorry, Aaron, I had to stick that in there as much as we possibly can to build those bridges and help people that need help within our own communities. Because guess what? When we learn to do that for ourselves, we will learn better how to do that for other people. And that's the next step, community service. I love the fact that we're, we're packing meals for people on Sunday. That's fantastic. <laughs> conventions didn't used to do that, and now we are. What if that wasn't just one, one day of the convention? What if this was like the major component of being an atheist? What if people knew everywhere that atheists are the ones who roll up their sleeves and do the work when it needs to be dealt with. We're the experts at helping the homeless. We're the experts at, at helping to solve some of these social problems. That would be a great, a great reputation to have. And one final thought. How about this for a reputation? Atheists are the experts at death, at dealing with death. You know, I, I've, been, I've been active in the atheist community for a long time, and... Uh, there have been young people that have come to me and asked me to officiate their weddings, which is really cool. And it's, uh, Jim's right, you know, that thing that as it happens is fantastic and it's been a privilege to do that. There are also now people who are coming to me asking to officiate their funerals. That's another kind of honor. It's, it's, it's a, I'll admit it's a bit of a weird one, but I think it's one that maybe we should lean into, right? And, and when I think about death, I think about, there's this really fantastic Buddhist parable. You may have heard it. So in the story, there's a man running through the forest and there's a tiger behind him, right? And it's chasing him and it's running faster than he can run and he knows the tiger's gonna catch him. He gets out of the forest and there's this cliff and there's nowhere for him to go. So he jumps down and he holds onto a branch that's coming out of the cliff and he holds on tight. He looks down, there's another tiger looking back up at him, just as hungry. He knows there's nowhere to go. At that moment, he looks at the branch and he sees a small vine coming off the branch and at the end of the vine, there's a small berry. He plucks the berry, pops in his mouth, and that's the sweetest experience of his life. This is our life. This is our experience. This is what life is for us. Let us speak to that. Let us embrace it and let us share it with others. What if we as atheists over the next two generations become the leading experts in death? What if we're done debating creationists and instead we become the kind of people most sought out to memorialize life's great transitions? That There's much we can say at times like this, and I think we just need to start practicing saying it to ourselves. You know, as atheists, we know that we are mortal, and as mortals, we are finite. But our existence is not limited to our physical form. Each of us as we go through life, touches the lives of other people. We are connected to each other as fellow human beings. All of us, the children of a common mother and a common father, separated by continents and millennia. The blood that courses in my veins courses as well in yours. We are connected to all the manifestations of life existing as but one of endless forms, most beautiful, on the branching and tangled tree of life. All of nature opens up before us. Earth itself is a rotating rock in space that provides us with our chemical identity, the very literal bonds of our existence. And we're connected with the cosmos itself, the cosmos that envelops and supports us, that birthed our sun with billions of its stellar siblings, the cosmic foundry of our base existence. We are not just animated clay. We are sentient star stuff. We are the cosmos made aware. We are atoms that feel love and loss. We are remarkable. This is something 
that we can say as atheists to place the lives of our friends and family in context to ensure that their memories are not forgotten in our lifetimes. We can say these things and affirm the humanist values of truth, equality, and love. And most importantly, we can say these things long after the national nightmare of evangelical hegemony and hypocrisy is a history lesson for my grandchildren. The question yet remains, will we? Thank you.